let's explain it this way. To understand, for somebody new saying, OK, that man is creating earthquakes, it's a big leap of to say that. And you have to understand, and I'm not saying you because you may well understand this, but people have to understand that how it happened. And that is best explained by equating it to a boombox stereo in a car. And the car drives past you and it's going doom, 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 doom. Yep. And next thing your windows are vibrating. And maybe you can even feel it through the floorboards or whatever. Wherever you are, you'll feel some vibration. And that is a low frequency causing that vibration. In this case, something you can hear. But there are low frequencies, lower frequencies, that are not even, say, audible, but they create that vibration effect. Now, if you use those electromagnetic frequencies at a high enough level, you can actually get that vibration happening in the Earth. And that is what they're doing. So it's not a man-made, it's a man-induced earthquake. Hi, this is Bruce Lipton, and you're listening to Planet FM. Kia ora, greetings, and welcome to Planet FM 104.6. I'm Tim Lynch, and I trust that you are doing well. I invite you to stay with me over the next hour as we discuss and find ways to take care of our unique and magnificent green planet Earth. Dear listeners, we had a number of telephone problems on this interview, fading out and dropping out, and we had to change different phones. It's very difficult with telephones in New Zealand because for some unknown reason the standard of the lines starts to deteriorate. And for four years we have not been doing any telephone calls within New Zealand because of the poor standard of telephone lines, and it's now... A big difficulty for us. So I'm letting you know that we have a few little challenges on this interview. And one of them being that I was talking too much. I talked too much. And I guess it's because the subject matter was so overwhelming and debilitating. So I apologise in advance. On the phone from the Hawke's Bay, I have Nigel Gray. And Nigel is an ordinary human being like us all, but he came into a prediction some years ago, and I'd like to share this with you. So kia ora first to you, Nigel. Kia ora. Kia ora. Nigel, how did you come into being involved with earthquakes and climate engineering, etc.? Well, I have been a painter and by trade... So what I did was I was looking always to see whether the weather was fine for painting and so forth because I had a few guys working for me and so it was very important to know, okay, is it going to be fine? And I went to the Met Service radars and was following those very carefully and looking at rain precipitation for an area, looking at the forecast, comparing things here and there. And I started to see some anomalies in the radars and so forth that could not be explained. Now, when I went to Met Service and asked them for answers to that and saying, well, I saw this anomaly or that thing, and their reaction to it was something I was a little bit shocked with because they more or less laughed at me. They mocked me and thought that I was seeing things or this kind of comment and that was something that took me by surprise for sure. So in any case I kept on looking at this and I found out more about weather modification and the possibility of that happening and so I started reading and I went the the nine miles. I did a lot of research and I did a lot of looking and so from there a lot of things have happened. And you became quite well known as a result of your addiction. Can you tell us, please? Well, what happened was on November 6th, 2016, I put up a post that basically started out, said, heads up on the 14th of November and a couple of days either side of that date, watch for a major earthquake and quite possible in the South Pacific area. And then I went on to explain a bit more about why I thought that. 
that there was a supermoon going to happen when the moon is closer to Earth on that particular date. And I had seen a lot of anomalies in the radars over the last two to three weeks prior to that point. And I thought something's going on here, something that is not normal. So I put out this warning and on, I think it was about two minutes after the hour on the 14th a.m., anyway, the earthquake hit on Kaikoura and there were two people killed. And, you know, most of New Zealand knows the story of what happened with Kaikoura. But that post I put out on November 6th and it went viral. And when the earthquake happened, it went viral. It went to international news in UK and Australia, New Zealand. And so immediately my Facebook page got inundated and I went from having 600 people on my page to something like 31,500 in a couple of days. Well, that's international news. And what were the people who were looking at that? What was their feeling about this? Did they realise that there was a bigger picture attached to it? Uh, Well, I guess some people were just following the excitement and jumping in to be a part of the excitement. But there's a good number of people who had seen similar things and were not satisfied with the, let's say, mainstream answers they were getting. And... So we're we're looking further and those people have stayed on and have kept looking and kept sharing information and so forth and I've built up quite a a lot of those. There were at the time, by the way, some very heavy critical attacks on me publicly and even some privately that was pretty uncomfortable but, you know, I kind of expected that was what it is and I know that there are quite a few people who have a different reaction to what I have when something like that happens or when there's something announced like that. To me, I like to know what's going on. Some people don't want to know what's going on because they fear it. I hear you very clearly, and this is something that we are endeavouring to let people know that we need to be aware of what's going on and still you know, contain our own inner sovereignty but be aware of the fact that there are things happening. We are coming to a greater understanding that the news today is, I don't like using this word fake news, but the news today is definitely slanted towards frightening people or terrifying people. They're not looking for any solutions really and the the solutions are not necessarily the ones that the grassroots or the community wants, it's usually a solution that's designed by the corporate or further up, shall we say, the pyramid of life. And so, yeah, we're dealing with all sorts of challenges around information. That's the big one, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. I mean, all due respect to the ban on plastic news that's come out recently, but I really feel that there's other things that were far more important, and yet all the concentration has been on this plastic bags in supermarkets. Now, is it a big issue? Well, a lot of people don't think it is the size of issue that is, it's being made out to be. And, and as I say, I'm not saying that we shouldn't have some regulation on that, but it would be very easy to put legislation through saying to the manufacturers of plastics to okay. say, yes. let's make these all biodegradable fully biodegradable. Let's change it from plastic to paper or whatever it is, to hemp or whatever. But they didn't need to come out and say, well, let's ban the plastic. But they did. I hear what you're saying. What it is is that we've been distracted into minor issues, important at one level, but very minor in the global sense. I know, it's like hobbits. The hobbits of New Zealand are focusing on the minute of life, when in actual fact we have to look at the biosphere as the greater component of existence. So you've looked at the geophysical aspect of an earthquake, but you also have taken in the weather patterns as well, and they're altering. And I know because 
I'm seeing all sorts of peculiarities myself and I was contacted very recently from a person who said that Auckland Island has got a transmitter down there and they sent photos from space of Auckland Island which is about, I don't know, a thousand kilometres virtually south of the South Island Correct. and it shows a whole lot of ripples in cloud formations rippling out from Auckland Island. That seemed very, very strange and I was told that there's a transmitter down there of sorts. Are we being influenced by transmitters located in certain areas? Well, probably many people have heard of the HARP facility in Alaska. That's one of the first ones that gets mentioned. <laughs> yes, for sure. But the whole technology has changed greatly. And let me step back a little bit. When I announced the earthquake, it was because it was a man-made one that I was concerned about. And that is why I said there's going to be an earthquake here. Because I saw these anomalies let's call it that for lack of something better, and I saw that there was a lot of electromagnetic frequency being delivered to the area off the east coast of the North Island down the lower side from, say, Cook Strait up, and that was what alerted me. Now, getting back to what I was saying, that some people go, oh, well, it's HARP, you know, the people who... Uh, let's say, researching this and looking at it and so forth. But over the last several years, there's been so much increase in technology, so much advancing technology on the subject of weather modification and geoengineering that there are many technologies, many patents for these technologies that are out there and there are a variety of technologies being used. I hear you very, very clearly, and we have to get an, an understanding of it. Now, Stephen Browning, the ex-member of Parliament for the New Zealand Green Party, mentioned that it was a large floating oil corporation seismic barge situated off the east coast of the South Island, somewhere between Christchurch and Kaikoura, around that area, at the particular time that these supposedly earthquakes were around and he just posited the idea that there could be some connection he wasn't saying there was but he did mention that it was a peculiarity and and this floating barge i've actually photographed one of them myself up in pearl harbor which of course is is the big military installation up in hawaii and so as you say with the technology is there a interface between the military and should we say, the corporate oil explorers, is there a bigger picture going on? I would have to answer absolutely on that. But let's explain it this way. To understand, for somebody new, saying, OK, the man is creating earthquakes, it's a big leap of... To say that, and you have to understand, and I'm not saying you because you may well understand this, but people have to understand that how it happens and that is best explained by equating it to a boombox stereo in a car. And the car drives past you and it's going doom, 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 doom. Yep. And next thing your window's vibrating. And maybe you can even feel it through the floorboards or whatever. Wherever you are, you'll feel some vibration. And that is a low frequency causing that vibration. In this case, something you can hear. But there are low frequencies, lower frequencies, that are not even, say, audible, but they create that vibration effect. Now, if you use those electromagnetic frequencies at a high enough level, you can actually get that vibration happening in the earth. And that is what they're doing. So it's not a man-made, it's a man-induced earthquake. Yes, yes. Well, Nikola Tesla had a little cigarette packet type apparatus that he put on a building in New York City and he started it up and everything was quiet. And then over the next hour, increasingly, things started to vibrate on that whole building to a degree that it was shaking so much that people started to panic. So he quickly took a hammer out and broke this unit and everything went still again. And so Tesla technology has been involved in this process and it was basically stolen from him because 
He didn't want the military to use some of his know-how, and this is where we go back to heart, and we can follow through on many other things. But Nikola Tesla understood this, and the so-called military-industrial complex have captured some of his technology and are using it. Is this the story? Exactly. That's right on the money. You know, really with these things, usually, to find out what is behind it, you usually do have to follow the money. And there's been an awful lot of money spent, and we're talking billions and billions. I think the federal accounts in US are missing some something like trillions of dollars. That can't be accounted for. <laughs> the black operation budget for US per year is some $40 billion, and that doesn't account for all of it. So where is all this money going? Well, I'm certain that the money is going into huge pushes in this technology and some of it we know about some of it we don't but it really is just incredible it is it is i know that there's a video clip just going around in the last week and it's where donald rumsfeld who became george w bush's secretary of defense in the year 2000 talking back in about 1993 about going in and grabbing space-based weaponry that was still actually under development and it was hinting at a space-based platform of lasers and other super-secret plasma weapons that can be deployed from a higher Earth orbit. And this also could mean that they're using radio frequencies from there as well as other technologies. So it's quite interesting. I'll just quickly drop this in. I spent time with a laser specialist in the UK. She was also a specialist in holograms who worked for the British government, and she introduced me to a young man who was in London, and he told me that in 1984 they were putting holograms in space, that the space shuttle was going up, and they were deploying all these different holograms in geostationary orbit around the whole planet. We don't know. He didn't tell me what they were for, but this is how far advanced the technology is, and we just don't know what's going on at all. And my gut feeling here is that we are not quite victims, but we are in a situation where a lot of stuff has been done and the human species doesn't know anything about it. Yep, true. Yeah. <laughs> yeah that, well, that's right. So what it is, is I, I didn't expect to even mention that, but it just came up. And so what we're having to do is recognise the fact that we are having weather wars at so many levels, or called frequency walls, where radio waves have been ramped up to such a degree that they perturb the clouds that in some instances make the clouds look like waves. And also it alters the barometric pressure. Barometric pressure is very important too. And and like you, I've noticed a lot of the weather patterns that have changed to the east and a lot of weather also comes down the west coast of the North Island all the way down off the Taranaki coast and then over really Nelson, it seems to sort of culminate. And this never used to happen. 40 years ago, 50 years ago, 60 years ago, it didn't happen. But it's happening now and it's happening very regularly. About four years ago, we had many tropical cyclones coming down from the north and they were hitting North Cape and coming down over Kaitaia. Well... This is something else, but I'm wanting to ask you what you feel is happening and if you can give some instances so that people can actually start researching it for themselves and becoming aware. Okay. Over the course of my research, I have come to the conclusion that our weather has been controlled globally, not just locally. And I know that sounds probably to some people shocking, but it's... It's, it's very much global. And in terms of local, if you look at weather radars, you will see sometimes, and this is on the visible satellite images taken looking down on the cloud and so forth, you'll see zigzag patterns which are known as sawtooth waves. If anyone is familiar with the old oscilloscopes, you could see different types of electromagnetic frequency waves and one was the sine wave which is kind of like a a curved up and down it's a regular wave 
and you'll see those as well. And you'll also see these sawtooth or triangular waves, which are as they sound. You know, a sawtooth is where it goes up and then drops, up and then drops, like a sawtooth. <laughs> and a triangular wave is just what it says. It's triangular. It goes up, down, up, down in a triangular fashion. You will also get square waves. Now, these you'll see more as almost like half rectangles that are not usually connected, but they will be there. Now, all of these shapes are quite clear, a very, very crisp lines between the cloud and blue sky, if you like, when you look on these radars. Now, that, to me, and to a lot of other people, is not natural not natural at all and these are the wavelengths that they use to push cloud around to push weather systems around now for new zealand most of the cloud that we're getting is actually produced by something like four or five power stations that are based in new south wales around there and i don't have the names for them at the moment but when i looked at all this i could see that the cloud was being produced by those power stations and then they were using these waves and these weather modification techniques to push the cloud back down over New Zealand. I believe there's probably a precipitation quota system for New Zealand by the government, which is all heavily denied, but that way they can actually control the weather here. Now, keeping track on what I'm saying here is that it's a very much a manufactured process of bringing that cloud down and bringing the weather into New Zealand and we would see that as oh just another day you know oh it's going to be fine or no it's going to be raining with no real thought that it's being caused by man pushing these weather systems over but that's what's happening now further to that more recently we have seen some other significant changes and there was also the additional technology of what you have mentioned, you mentioned earlier the base-based weapons and in, I think it was 1983, was it, Reagan announced a Star Wars project? Yes. And then all of a sudden we hear that that has been shelved and you don't hear anything more about it. But I don't believe US projects like that get shelved. I think they just advance to a point where they get mentioned as shelved and all the rest goes undercover. Goes dark. Exactly. And I think that's what happened with Star Wars. It continued. And absolutely, there are satellites up there that are not only controlling weather and so forth and used in all of this, also we're starting to get into this directed energy weapon technology, if you like. And we saw this recently with the California wildfires, which was actually a directed energy weapon event. Most notably, the latest one, because as they go and do this more and more and more, because this technology's been around for, for years, but they become more overt about it. They don't care anymore about how obvious it is. Now, one of the most notable uses of that technology, by the way, was the highway of death in Iraq. Right at the end of the Iraq war, there were all of the soldiers were retreating, thousands, uh, down a main highway. Is that from Kuwait? Yep. And the two ends of that highway were blocked off, and the statement was that they were bombed to death, basically. But I don't believe that's what happened. And uh, if you look at photos of that highway of death, the cars all burned out in the very same way that you'll see cars burned out in the latest California wildfires. Now, I more recently came across something about this. It was in a strange place. It was in the marketplace. I was looking on the subject and I found that just in the last, well, in 2017, the investment market started promoting directed energy weapons as a good investment. 
And I have this article here in front of me at the moment. It says, according to statistics MRC, whatever that is, the global directed energy weapons market is expected to grow from $8.12 billion in 2016 to reach $41.97 billion by 2023, with a CAGR, that's compound annual growth rate, of 26.4%. So what that tells me, what that tells us, is that it, as of... 2016, the directed energy weapon market was already $8.12 billion per annum. Yes, I hear you. So what we're looking at, and this is the use of lasers of, as you say, plasma-type weapons. There's a whole list here of uh, technologies covered. High-power microwave technology, particle beam weapons, High energy laser technology. It sounds like I'm making this up. This is this is somebody promoting, and this letter has been promoted widely through investment channels to people trying to interest people in investing in the directed energy weapon market. Well, this is the biggest problem we've got at the moment, Nigel. Is that the human race wants peace, and most people, your neighbours. They don't want to be involved in all this. They want to get on with life. They want to live as a happy community. And we have got, shall we say, pirates out there who have, in many ways, taken over the military-industrial complex globally. I mean, we have... What you're talking about is that this is a Western story that you're telling us, but we're, in many ways, trapped by this because it's very difficult for us to get through to our MPs, to our congressmen or senators or anybody in the Politburo anywhere because the system is so top-heavy with power and corrupted power. Yes, and if you try to get any truth on this matter, of course you can easily be laughed out as a a defence because it's so incredible that nobody would believe it. But that is how they defend it as well they can actually hide it because who would believe this could happen? And because of that, it it continues unabated. Yeah, with the military-industrial complex as it is, it's it's difficult. I mean, just quickly again, Donald Rumsfeld mentioned one day before 9-11 that they had lost $2.5 trillion from the U.S. military budget. And then when the Twin Towers went down, the whole subject was completely dissolved and... Nobody thought about that anymore because they were into finding who did the terrorist attack on New York, even when we find out naturally that it was an inside job or deliberately allowed to happen. But this is the problem that we have in the world, is that the media is stealing our attention all the time and taking us away from what is real and what is truthful and they're feeding us lies, distortions, half-truths, as well as scandal and titillation, that in many cases people are becoming so desensitised and uh, turning off. And the more you have a society turning off, the more the vested interests can actually control the narrative. That's right. Yeah, it's easy also, because this is so dark, to get serious and and to feel, wow, this is just horrible and, you know, it's not very good for... (laughs) It's not very good for morale or whatever to know all of this bad news is happening. But And so if you can step back a little bit and look at this when it happens and go, okay, it's better to know something and know that something could happen and not get pulled down by it. And so that when it happens, you don't get a big shock. So really, that's how you need to take it, I think. And, and that's how I managed to stay on top of it without getting pulled down. I listen to it, I understand it, but I don't let it drag me down or let it rule my life. It's very important. I hear a lot of people saying, OK, if you go down and look down the rabbit hole, this is the, the terminology that they say when you look into things that are outside consensus reality, when you go down this rabbit hole and check out all these things that are on the web, some people call it the dark web. I don't really go there at all. But it's having to 
learn more. Sometimes there's a saying that we have to basically know about the dark to be able to resist them. Well, yes, there's another way and it's always to stay in the light as well, but but sometimes staying in the light can allow the dark to sneak around behind us and so it's a difficult one to deal with and I just want to say thank you, Nigel, for just letting people know that we don't have to allow this to affect us. We have to have some very good, what I say, inner disciplines. I do meditation. I do twice a day. I also do... This morning I got up, I did my salute to the sun and I also did my Tai Chi. And so when we are resourcing ourselves from within, making sure that our heart beats strongly and that we are lighthearted, it can allow us the strength to be part of the world and to get the message out. We need humanity to basically (laughs) get it together as 7.6 billion human beings to make sure that we've got a future for children. I'm speaking with Nigel Gray, who made a prediction some years ago regarding an earthquake, and he is also now looking at all the variables relating to weather and geophysiology on our planet. And today we're looking at our options, in particular, that we have a future for all biota, all the animals. So as a planetary civilization coming into being... And working towards a global family, we have got many, many issues facing us. And I'm looking for what the best option is to ignite people's consciousness, to waken people up, to really get involved in what's happening at the moment because we cannot allow it to happen any longer. Nigel, we need to be able to get up and become self-empowered and and actually recognise that there is a far greater picture involved in this whole process of life on Earth. And there's also, when I look at geoengineeringwatch.org up in California, they showed another aspect of, through geoengineering by solar radiation management, putting up particles uh, into the sky to reflect sunlight back into space to supposedly stop our planet from warming. There's a huge, huge debate around that. And I just hear a, a word called atmospheric ordinance, where the military are using space as a method to influence what's going down here in the terrestrial environment. So... Yes. Heaps and heaps are happening. <laughs> I know, I'm glad to hear you laugh. <laughs> because, because we cannot allow us to be pushed out of a game. We have to be strong. So, here's, what... here's, here's the thing. Here's the thing. You have to remember, life is a game. And we're playing it as it's a big game, right? And you can, you can be the, the person who's having the ball kicked at you (laughs) or you can be running with the ball and for me I like to be one step ahead on the game and and by knowing this stuff we can be empowered we you know we know what's going on but it allows us to keep one step ahead and because the game is unwritten we we are the writers and so the whole idea of all this technology is what? To create victims, to make people fearful and so forth. We don't have to go that way. We can go, okay, that's what's happening. Now let me live my life the way I want it to be lived. And if every person was aware of what was going on, I assure you, or I, I'm certain it wouldn't happen. It, it, just, it just would fade Well, we definitely have to take the upper hand all the time. I do agree. And this is where we need to continue to research, be aware, communicate with other people who want to bring about the change. I mean, we were able to bring New Zealand to become a nuclear-free country because it was done by people power. That's right. And we're nearly on the way to a GE or GMO free country as well. We're very close to that. We're looking at the moment 5G technology and there's a good group working at the moment to make sure that we can ban 5G wireless technology. 
And so, again, it's only when we work together and we work in a fulsome way and that we still carry with us a good heart to do what needs to be done, bearing in mind there are a lot of people who you mentioned who have reneged or have found themselves too much of a victim to be able to actually bring the change or be part of this initiative to clean the whole game up. I mean, human beings, how does a human being live on a planet? This is the first question. And where we come from families and we are based around either tribes or clans and now we're into what you call a greater community and there is a global community and I'm talking with a global community, I'm talking unity consciousness. We need to be able to have sovereignty to a a marked degree for our countries but we also need to look at unity consciousness of all 7.6 billion people on this planet working for the benefit of the whole, working for the benefit of the greater good. That's right, yeah. Actually, to that end, I recently, uh, in the last couple of weeks, I've started a, a competition for activists, and the competition is is that Basically, and I hope it's going to be, I'm planning it to be an annual event where activists in the different fields trying to raise awareness of their different issues will be awarded with recognition and with some sort of prizes. So people, I'm getting people to donate toward those prizes and I'm also making some donations myself toward it. And then we will raise and elevate the position of those activists because these are people who are speaking out. These are people who are protecting us. And if you look back in history, you look at asbestos, uh, thalidomide and so forth, the disasters that have been government approved and later been withdrawn. You know, there are new disasters happening right now and these activists are speaking out about it we should be holding them in high regard. We should be giving them awards and so forth. And that's the plan of my my prize, my competition. It's a real wonderful idea. It's a noble effort. Well done. And w- because it is the people who are acknowledged are these CEOs right at the top of the system who are basically controlling everything up there. And if they can have just three quarters, three that's nine months of profit for their corporation, they're seen as a king, they're seen as a god, and they're off to the (laughs) next corporation to do exactly the same. But most of them are just cutting costs everywhere. There's no innovation, and the other thing is there's no duty of care. You will find at the moment there's nobody in a leadership position globally who are standing out and saying, okay, let's talk about the children of today and tomorrow. Let's build the equation around children. Nigel, we just don't have that leadership. Hence, this is what GreenPanetFM.com has been focusing on. We have to do it at a grassroots level. That's where the shift is going to be because that's where the bulk of humanity are. Well, I think, I believe we can outsmart (laughs) <laughs> we can outsmart them. And, and this competition is, is an effort to do that as well. Is it, let's put it there. And the name of my competition, by the way, is is Leveling the Playing Field. <laughs> yep, that's right. Well, we do because it's always been slanted against us because of the structure of a pyramid where it's run from the top. And we, of course, are in the base of a pyramid and we're actually holding it up through our labour and goodwill and working. And so, yes, this is important. And I want to be able to mention a a few names of people whom you can look at uh, to gain more knowledge. If you want to go into this field, and I've already mentioned uh, geoengineeringwatch.org, and there's also a video, a YouTube man called Dutch Since, D-U-T-C-H, Dutch. Yep. S-I-N-C-E. He has got some incredible technology for you to be able to look at when he shows what's happening within the geosphere, within, he shows earthquake swarms and he can give us an understanding of what's happening 
on many, many levels. Is there anybody else that you'd like to mention? My friend Rick Duart is an American and he has a Facebook page called Weather Wars International and he does, for years of his life, he's, let's say, semi-retired now, but he works flat out on researching the weather events that are going on all over the world and presents it every day. And he is exposing the truth on that, that matter. So there was him and, and uh, you've probably heard of Ilana Freeland. Yes. I, I, had, I had the opportunity to interview her recently and she has written several books on the subject of weather modification, of directed energy weapons and so forth. So these are international, of course. In New Zealand, we have just a, a handful of people who are generally working more on the situ- things such as uh, vaccinations and uh, exposing of 1080 poison. Well, exposing of it, uh, it's pretty pretty well exposed. But but uh, you know, raising people's awareness that it's quite a, a toxic uh, poison and and uh, something we really need to speak out. You know, uh, online polls show 80% of uh, New Zealanders are against 1080, but apparently the government hasn't heard that. <laughs> yes, well, this is, this is, again, another focus on other things, and we all have to get involved. It's a very difficult one to inspire people to get off the couch, but we, we're working on it, Nigel. So... As I said, the this is about climate engineering, earthquakes, weather wars, frequency wars. It's all about high technology being used against an unsuspecting public. Can, can I say something? Yeah, sure. You know... I don't think there's probably many of your listeners who wouldn't believe in some way or another that we're spiritual beings. And I think that too. I think we are spiritual beings. And and I think that what we're looking at here, really, with all of those things that you just mentioned, we have to... the, The way we combat this is we have to raise our awareness level. And I don't mean just what we look at, I mean, spiritually, we need to look at, okay, let's be able to look at everything without getting pulled down. And the more we do that, as I say, we're becoming more empowered. And so that's why it's so important to to look at these things, not not as like, oh, this is bad news, but a thing of, okay, now I'm actually... Like playing the game in a bigger way. I'm looking at more things. Well, you're looking at more things. You're extending your sphere of influence as well. I hear and, you. And there was another thing I wanted to point out, which is something which came up prior to this interview. And over the last few days, we have seen some very cold weather happen in the South Island. And and, of course, you know, it goes hot and it goes cold, but there are extremes happening here. I was researching that, and I found... I was looking at where's all this coming from, and what I found is that it wasn't like any sort of normal weather event. And why I say that is because there was no front, if you like. No, you know, you hear about a, a there's a cold front coming over. Well, it wasn't a cold front. It was an entire wind current, air current, coming up from the Antarctica. And that made me think, okay, well, what's going on here when the wind, the air current is coming up from Antarctica? I looked further and I found that the magnetic poles have been moving, and I I was aware of this, but I hadn't looked lately, and the magnetic poles are moving uh, around on the planet, and to such an extent that, for example, uh, in Tampa, Florida, the uh, the airport actually repainted their runways and changed their runways around yes. uh, because of this magnetic change, because it actually 
uh, stuffed them up in some way, if you like. So I looked at where the South Pole is, and I was shocked. This has only happened last night. And I was shocked to find that it, it's actually somewhere between, and I mean almost like halfway between Antarctica and New Zealand. And that answered a few questions for me. Uh, something's going on, and so why? So we're we're on this complicated planet here, where there's not only men, unscrupulous men, trying to take advantage of us with weather weapons and so forth, but there's also a changing environment, and we've got this. Well, actually, what happens? Apparently, every three thousand six hundred years or so, the magnetic poles of the Earth flip. Um, so the north becomes the south and the south becomes the north. Now, what that involves and how severe it'll be, nobody really knows. That's because right. Nobody's been around for that long. <laughs> so they only guess. And so you, you, you will see that the scientists, scientists, a lovely word, uh, will say, oh, the slip happens very gradually and over a period of thousands of years. Well, I invite you to take a couple of magnets and see how quickly they flip. Very much so. It gets to a certain point. You can get them to a certain point and then suddenly it goes, bam, and and they snap together. Snap together is correct, yes. And, And I believe that's what's going to happen. Now, when that happens, it could be years from now, true, uh, but... It's going to happen. It's, it's, it's going to happen, and, and so, you know, be prepared, you know, just be aware that we're on a changing planet. <laughs> Very much so. Well, I think we have to look at things that, in a different way. I mean, Buckminster Fuller also said that the wind does not blow, the wind sucks. And he said that hot air rises. So when hot air rises, cooler air comes in to fill the vacuum. And I think it's very important for us to turn everything around. Uh, It helps me see things in a different way. It's like when it's all said and done, cold air comes off the poles and swirls around, slowly around our planet until it gets closer and closer to the tropics. Why? Because the heat of the tropics warms the air, causing it to rise and go up, and it draws in the cooler air underneath. And then we have tropical cyclones that go towards the poles, and they have a different barometric pressure. And this is another interesting thing to look at. Let's have a look at the oceans and water. The the Tasman Sea or the Pacific Ocean... That is actually comprised of two invisible gases, one hydrogen gas and two oxygen gas. And when hydrogen and oxygen come together, they form water. It becomes a a physical manifestation of two invisible gases making water that's got heavy mass. And so there are so many other influences, Nigel, Affecting us, we have to be aware of the so-called magic that comprises of existence. And we've got to have a whole new look. We've got to reorient our thinking as to, you know, what is reality and what is not. And I agree with you so much. I'm going to jump right back. We are spiritual beings having a physical plane or an earth plane existence. Or and taken another way, we are incarnate souls who are, we've got a body and we've got a soul essence and it's for us to recognize and remember that because we don't know where soul comes from other than the fact that there's enough recorded medical knowledge on people who have had out of a body or near death experiences. Anyone who's actually researched it and studied it will realize that we live beyond this physical body and people in hospitals who have experienced looking down on themselves and seeing the doctors working on their body know and from then on they will always remember that they are more than their physical body. People have to study this and research it. We are energy bundles of exponential potential essentially and we have to be able to utilize our full capabilities and grow into the light of our own true selves and 
again, it's time for us to, you know, we need a spiritual renaissance. We need a, a cultural renaissance. We need a human renaissance to find the solutions to the challenges that we're in. There's a woman called Barbara Marks Hubbard from the United States. She must be in her 90s now, and I have previously interviewed her. And she said, subconsciously, the human race in many ways has caused this huge crisis we're basically in the middle of. We've actually caused the environmental challenges, the social challenges, and the economic challenges. And this cause is now the evolutionary driver to force us to come together to find another way out of this whole thing so that we can change the paradigm from where we are now to a new paradigm that we don't know what is but we know it's one of community of caring of sharing of love of a light-hearted way of being able to live lightly on our planet i guess you would agree with that Oh, I, I agree, and no, I think it's looking at the positive side of it, it's exciting times. <laughs> That's right. It's exceptionally, because there have been so many fantastic people who have come to the planet not over, you know, 2,000 years ago, but more recently with, you know, Nikola Tesla and Victor Schauberger and Walter Russell and Rudolf Steiner, others who have brought new technologies in. I can even go as far as saying as... Bruno Gruning, who people know very little about. There are people who have come through to show us the way in which to bring through a higher way of doing life, a more connected way, a more just a way to be able to bring peace to our planet, to bring peace to our planet, yeah. Yes, that's right. It's a matter of the old, the old analogy is the glass half empty or is it half full <laughs> that's correct and behind every dark cloud shines a very bright sun as a mate of mine used to say a very small hinge can swing a very large door there are all these analogies for us to be able to find a way through this particular impasse and take us into a higher dimension of coexistence and love and we're out of time can you can you share something from your heart nigel well, I think we just covered it. I think hold up, be high, you know, live high. Don't don't look at this as, as a bad side of the problem. Look at it as the positive. Very good. Nigel, I want to say thank you very much for wanting to share with New Zealanders and particularly everybody else around our magnificent planet. Okay, you're welcome. Thanks for the opportunity. That was Nigel Gray talking on weather, frequency and geopolitical warfare on our home planet, Mother Earth, but more so at a metaphysical level and a spiritual context to this very important subject. And finally talking about the more closer feelings about how we as a humanity can come together and work as a global family coming into being. I'm also wanting to give a shout out to the cetaceans, the whales and the dolphins, these great big brain beings who share the waters with us, they are under assault from sonar, from satellites scanning the water with all sorts of intrusive, heavy-duty scalar frequencies. Their whole sound system, their whole listening system is under huge assault as the various navies around the world search 24-7 for submarines that are lurking. Dear listeners, I'm back on the air again. This is 8 o'clock at night and some hours after the interview. And I'm wanting to speak to Nigel. We have a little window to be able to fill. And I just want to say, Nigel, you've reflected on the interview we had today. Is there anything else that you feel that you'd like to add? Okay. Well, there is, actually. And I w was really good to talk today and talk to let people know what was happening and so forth. But when we stand up, and this, I'm not just speaking for me, I'm taking the liberty of speaking for others who are activists, we are taking a stand because we want a better future for our children, for the country, for everybody. And... 
I'm glad I'm not a politician because I think we can do a lot more from outside the political system than we could if we were inside. And I think a lot of politicians find that out right after they're elected. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so here we are, you know, we have a voice. And there was a survey done quite some time ago on news articles and uh, media articles and they found that that comments made on a website after an article could actually harm the content of the article or the or the whole subject and and change things and that was just the comments Th- this was quite a, a big international survey that was done and as a result of that survey quite a few news outlets changed their operating basis and they knocked out being able to post messages after the argument. Now, I find that really interesting (laughs) because what it's telling you is, yes, the people's word does matter. And you look at great people like Gandhi who changed entire nations and you can see that the power of one person is huge and we can do this. So it, just by working together, of course, we're, we're even more powerful. And right at this moment, I, I think it's a very exciting time because there's a lot of people in New Zealand who are working together. From, I mean, I'm working with people of different faiths, different beliefs and so forth, and they know that I have a different belief to them and I know they, we all have different beliefs. But we're going, hey, that doesn't matter. What matters is our future. And if there's anything I could put there, it's, it's that message of let's work together and take responsibility. And you don't believe that we can change something? We sure can. We have proven it time and time again. Very true. We all share the same breath, Nigel. We have got something in common, something that's actually invisible, but we still have that in common sacred breath so yes and what you say is true i've noticed that many of the major newspapers have cut out the comment section including the new zealand herald too particularly because there was pushback by lots of people who actually didn't like the article or felt that the article in many cases was not for the benefit of the human race our common future and so yes so fantastic is there anything else well, I have the unusual distinction of being blocked from quite a few of the mainstream news websites in New Zealand. And it's not that I've said anything particularly bad, but again, it just goes to show that there are some things, some truths they don't want to know. <laughs> very good, very good. Well, look, fantastic. I want to say thank you again for coming and just sharing this last few moments. Nigel, excellent. This is really, really good. And thank you for your insight. Thank you for what you're doing because you're right. There are so many people supporting the idea for a better world. Cheers, brother. Appreciated. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Decide to network. Use every letter you write, every conversation you have, every meeting you attend, every email you send. And remember, even Facebook. To tweet and to express your fundamental beliefs and dreams. Affirm to others the vision of the world you want. Network through thought. Network through action. Network through love. Network through the spirit. You are the centre of a network. You are the centre of the world. You are a free, immensely powerful source of life and goodness. Affirm it, spread it, radiate it. Think day and night about it and you will see a miracle happen. The greatness of your own life in a world of big powers, media and monopolies, but of 7.6 billion individuals Networking is the new freedom, the new democracy, a new transparency, and a new form of wholeness and happiness. This originated by Dr. Robert Muller, Chancellor of the World Peace University in Costa Rica, Central America. I invite you to be able to come to greenplanetfm.com where we have over 400 interviews in our database 
which you can readily download and listen to to be able to inspire yourself to become the change you want to see in the world and become involved in caring for your children and grandchildren's future. We are also on Facebook, on Green Planet FM and OurPlanet.org. Please come and love us. This is Tim Lynch. And or Lisa Eyre. And Liz Gunn. In the spirit of Aroha, wishing you a wonderful week.